Good morning. morning. Welcome to Orange Baptist Church. It's good to be with all of you today. It's um, especially good to have our guests with us. If you're here for the first time, we want to get to know who you are. Um, We have red books on every pew, and we ask that everybody take those books and pass them down. And as they come by you, um, guests, if you'd leave your information for us so that we can contact you this week. Phone number or email address, your preferred mail uh, method of contact, and we will do that this week. There are quite a few announcements um, in the bulletin. Take time to look through those, uh, everybody. Uh, I'll just sort of hit hit everything quickly. Um, Our Lent services are this have begun, and um, they're on Wednesdays at 12:15 at St. Thomas Episcopal Church. Our church is providing the meal and the sermon and all that this this coming Wednesday. So uh, please come and be a part of that as well. Um, There's a resource available in the vestibule and in the commons for families, uh, especially families with children. Um, families, please, uh, please go by and take one of those resources. It's a good um, conversation starter to have with, with your children on issues of faith. Um, on Saturday, we have a sort of a rare opportunity to have uh, ancient Hebrew scrolls um, downstairs in the Pine Room. They're at least 250 years old, and they contain the, the Old Testament scriptures. And they'll be here in our... Uh, Pine Room on Saturday, uh, available from 12 to 4. Um, so if you would, and then there's presentations at 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock on those scrolls. If you'd like to come early and help set up or stay late and help take down, that would also be appreciated. This month uh, in March, we are again celebrating and observing our offering for global missions, taking up a special offering for um, which 100% will go towards our missionaries in the field, our CBF missionaries, uh, some who are close to home and some who are all the way around the world. Um, So please uh, consider giving sacrificially this season of Lent to support the work of Christ going on throughout the whole world. And Lindsay now has has an announcement to make. Before she comes up, you can come on up, but as you're coming up, um, Meg Camp next week will be in our, our congregation. She's coming um, to sort of give a report, and she's also coming to talk about the upcoming trip um, that some of our folks from Orange Baptist will be taking down to Honduras. Um, and so please please come and be part of worship and hear what, what she's doing down in Honduras. And um, she'll be around during that weekend, too, and I, th- I think there's some information in the bulletin about other times you can see her. Lindsay? morning. Today is the day. It's our fundraiser day. So um, I just wanted to let everybody know that from three to six, we will have the fundraiser here at the church in the Pine Room. And um, Amy Fitch, she is so awesome. She is coming now to set it up so that if you don't have a chance to come back this afternoon, you can go take a peek at what she has downstairs. Um, and that might be easier for everybody. So, And everything that she's making from this, she is donating to the youth group. So um, again, she's not here, but I'm thanking her because she's amazing. And um, I hope to see you guys there. O God, from whom every gift derives, we gather to worship you this day. You are an awesome God, greater than our comprehension or our imagination. You are beyond any word we could ever use to describe you, and yet, through Jesus, we know the intimacy of your vast love. We've come to you in thanksgiving and praise to know that you are God and to place our lives anew in your perspective. Enlarge our vision this hour with your word. May your Holy Spirit surround and indwell this congregation now. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. find the responsive reading in your program and follow me responsibly as we read Psalm 51. 
Having mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me fairly with my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you alone have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Purge me with his sin, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Let us pray together. Holy God, in these midst, quiet moments, would you hear our prayers? We take great comfort in knowing that you see each one of us and you know our deepest needs. And yet, you have still told us to come to you in prayer, and so we do so with humility and faith. Lord, some of us are sick. We ask that you would heal us. Some of us are without work. We ask that you would be our provider. Some of us can no longer see through our tears. Would you heal our hurts? We're so grateful for the many 
beautiful blessings that you've given to us. And we don't forget them. But we know that you are not a stranger to our sorrows. So we give them to you now. Take them and bring beauty from the ashes as only you can do. Lord, we pray today for victims of the tornadoes in Alabama, those who lost their homes, those who lost their loved ones. It's terrible to think about such loss and devastation and how these people have just lost everything. Would you bring comfort? And may the people of God rise up to show your love in many ways through this time of tragedy. Thank you for your love and your grace that covers a multitude of our sins. We pray in your most holy name. Amen. Join me in prayer, please. Father, we've been blessed with many talents. Talents that help us spread your word throughout the world. Through missionaries, through teachers, through prophecy. We pray now that you would help us help those who spread the word 
through our gifts, our gifts that we've earned and that we share with you. We just ask that you open our hearts, let us give generously, and always to glorify you. These things we ask in Him. Amen. seated and when our children come forward for the children's sermon. Good morning. I have a question for you. And you can be honest with me. Have you ever been caught with your hand in the cookie jar? You don't have one? <laughs> you don't have a cookie jar? I'll get you one for Christmas. Sometimes we think we can get away with something. We make plans. And we look around, 
And we don't think anybody's looking. We don't make any noise. <laughs> and we get a cookie, real quick. And then what happens? You, we get caught? You get caught. How in the world do your parents know that you've been in the cookie jar? They just suddenly walk in. They might walk in. They, do you think they have eyes in the back of their heads? Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about this morning. Do you remember David in the Bible? Who was David? Prophet. How about King David? King David. He was a great king. A king? Yes. David was a king. But David did something that God didn't like. He got caught. He didn't think anybody saw him because what he did was during the night. He didn't think anyone saw him. Oh, but who did? God. God sent his prophet, Nathan, to catch David. And Nathan went to him. He talked to him, and David finally realized, oh, God knows what I did. So what do you think David did? If someone catches you doing something, what do you do? Say you're sorry? Uh -huh. He did. David said he was sorry. But God could not let David go on. He loved David so much that he wanted to make sure David knew what he did was wrong. So thinking about that, the next time you want a cookie, what can you do? Ask. Oh, that is so great. Ask for it. Have a cookie. Do you want a graham cracker? No? Okay. Okay, let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all the goodness that you've given to us. And we know that at times we will try and sneak our hands into the cookie jar. When we do, help us to realize that what we did was a lie or it was that we've stolen something we weren't supposed to. And help us to realize that we've done something wrong and to say that we're sorry. Thank you, Lord, for your guidance and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. wrong with those kids I'll, I'd, I'd take one I'll take a graham cracker a young man named John received a parrot as a gift the parrot had a bad attitude and even a worse vocabulary every word out of the parrot's mouth was rude obnoxious laced with profanity John tried to change the bird's attitude by consistently saying only polite and positive words, playing soft music, anything that, that he could think of to, to clean up the bird's vocabulary. Finally, John was fed up and he yelled at the parrot and the parrot yelled back and John shook the parrot and the parrot even got more angry and rude and John just in desperation, he, he threw up his hands and he grabbed the parrot and this, grabbed this bird and he put him in the freezer for, for a few minutes. And the, and the parrot squawked and kicked and screamed and then suddenly there was total quiet. Not a peep 
was heard for over a minute, and fearing that he'd hurt the parrot, quickly John opened up the door to the freezer. The parrot calmly stepped out onto John's outstretched arm and, and said, I believe I may have offended you with my rude language and actions. I sin I'm sincerely remorseful for my inappropriate transgressions, and I fully intend to do everything I can to correct my rude and unforgivable behavior. John was stunned at the change in the bird's attitude, and he was about to ask the parrot what had made such a dramatic change in his behavior, and the bird continued, may I ask what the turkey did? <laughs> On this first Sunday of Lent, we're looking at repentance and what that means. While, while we most likely won't be put into the freezer for our infractions, we, we do need to look seriously at our own lives and what we have done wrong. David is called a man after God's own heart. And while he was great and he was the model king of Israel, the one from whom the lineage of the Jesus was to come, he was not without his flaws. And the Bible doesn't do anything to camouflage those flaws. It tells us everything in, in detail about the times when David messes up. That's the story of David and Bathsheba. And the story begins back in chapter 11, before our reading for today, where it, where it says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. But, but this king... Perhaps had gotten a little lazy, and so he didn't go out to battle himself. The text kind of gets a little jab in at David. He stayed home, and, and he rose late one afternoon, it says, from his couch. And he saw Bathsheba on, from his rooftop down below bathing. And with everything going on in the news now, some of which is about our Baptist brethren and others concerning sexual abuse, it's good that people are speaking out. And, but what we can see is that it's the same old story repeating itself over and over again. People wanting to take what is not theirs. People doing like David did. And he took Bathsheba for his own. And she becomes pregnant. And, and he sends Uriah, her husband, to the fiercest point of battle so that he would die. And that's what happens. David essentially kills Uriah by using another army as the murder weapon. And that brings us to today's reading. If, if you want to follow with me, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 15, on, on page 273 in your pew Bible. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I, ga I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have smitten Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife, and have slain him with the sword of the Amorite, Ammonites. 
Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun, for you did it in secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. You know, like Jesus, Nathan, he uses a parable to teach or to show David the error of his ways. And and this, this takes guts. My religion teacher in high school said, if you want to give your son a strong name, name him Nathan, because Nathan had to call a king, a murderer, to his face, and he did it. But he didn't come right out and do it. He, he used this parable to sort of come in the back door. It's a really effective tactic because it gets David all upset about this man who is rich and has lots of flocks and who steals this precious You lamb from the poor man. It was his only lamb. Slept in his home, ate his food, drank his drink, played with his children. He loved it and cared for it. And when the rich man took that little you lamb, just because he could and because he wanted to, that made David hot, saying the man deserved to die. He took the bait. He condemned the man, not knowing that David was condemning himself. It's it's irony. The tension between what is said and what's not said and the fact that the audience, we, get to play along. It's an effective technique to lay a trap for an unsuspecting person like David. And David jumps right in. And if it weren't so dire a situation, we might sense humor in it. He He reminds me of a fictional character by the name of Don Quixote. In a particular episode, Don Quixote springs into action to defend the honorable Don Gaiferos, who is under threat by the Moors. And this sequence, though, is is really just a puppet show portraying the actual event. And Don Quixote leaps onto the stage to come to the rescue of his personal hero, and he succeeds in only destroying the set and ruining the puppet show. Don Quixote's attempt at gallantry is, like one scholar puts it, it's an attempt to invade the impenetrable world of fiction. Now, the hero of our story is not an exaggerated buffoon as the self-proclaimed knight Don Quixote, but David's willingness to jump into a reality that is not meant to be entered in such a way It makes me have a somewhat nervous chuckle at David's response, at David's expense, because because David's willingness to charge in without any regard for the consequences he would face. Hugh Piper talks about this story and the irony in it. He says, David leaps into the unresolved gap between the rich man and the poor man in the story, appointing himself to the role of just judge who will address this imbalance only to be told the role he really plays is that of the unscrupulous oppressor. Just like the reader of Don Quixote watches the folly unfold as the knight has his moment of realization, the reader of Samuel watches as David achieves the moment of realization as well, realizing what he'd been missing, realizing that he had been the guinea pig in Nathan's parable that was meant to show his hand. And so so Nathan sets David up, he takes the bait, he he condemns the man in the story, not realizing that he condemns himself. And Nathan says, you are the man. He tells him about all the consequences of his actions, the consequences of his sin. And at that point, David could have killed the man, could have killed Nathan. He could have put him in the dungeon. He was the king. 
But David recognizes his sin. And he says, I have sinned against the Lord. And he shows us again what it means to be the man after God's own heart. He repents. The psalm that we read earlier and that we heard the choir sing is, is attributed to David after this episode. And he, he doesn't try to justify himself, say why he did what he did. You know, so much of our culture and our, our lives today and our politics and all different parties, when faced like a scandal like this, like David's, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. It, only to find out later that there's evidence. And they have to eat crow and fess up. And while they could have just admitted it in the first place, David skips all this dancing around the truth and he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. Against you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The acceptable sacrifice to God is a broken and contrite heart. A contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Just when we thought that David couldn't recover from his actions, he reminds us what it means to repent. To have a broken and contrite heart. To admit to God and to others that you were wrong. So what does that mean for us? How can we learn from this? Bishop Ambrose of Milan was an influential character in the life of uh, St. Augustine. And in the 4th century, right after ordering the massacre of 7,000 citizens of Thessalonica, the emperor, Theodosius, traveled to Milan and went to his church, the Bishop, of, Bishop Ambrose, to have communion there. Ambrose intercepted the emperor at the door and he said, You cannot enter here with hands soiled by human blood. Theodosius claimed that if he was guilty of murder, then so was King David, the man after God's own heart. Ambrose unwaveringly replied, you have imitated in David in his crime. Imitate him now in repentance. How often do we imitate the crime, but not the repentance? We're good at committing the crime. It's part of our sinful nature as humans. We, we can commit the crime. But it's more difficult for us to repent. I think that's why in the psalm it says, create in me a, a clean heart. The word there, create, is the same word used in the beginning in creation. Where God created the heavens and the earth. From nothing, God created humans and animals when there was nothing there. In the creation, God made something out of nothing. The same word is used here for create a new heart when it isn't there. It's not that he's asking God to, to rework his heart or to, to dress it up. He's asking God to create a new heart, a clean heart, because there isn't one there. The psalmist is asking God to create in him a heart that is pure, that longs for God, that values God over anything else. He's asking God to, to make his heart clean because it's something that we can't do ourselves. We can't work on our own heart to make it right or as pure as it needs to be. We need God to change us. We need God to give us that new and right spirit with us so that we can choose him above all else. God must do the creating, the washing, the restoring, because only he has the power to forgive our sins from when we've turned away from him. Only he has the power to, to forgive our making ourselves more important than him, choosing 
to take what is not ours. But what we must do, and what we're reminded of during this time of Lent, is to come to our senses, like David did, and look at our lives and what we have done, how we've rearranged our priorities and put ourselves first. And, and we must turn back to God. That's what it means to repent, to stop what we're doing and to turn to God. Look at how we've sinned, how we've made ourselves to be God instead of God and ask Him to forgive. Ask God to create new hearts in us that put Him first. We must make God to be God in our hearts. So what do you need to give up for Lent? Candy? Eating out? Facebook? How about anything that puts your desires above God's? How about this Lent? We give up being God ourselves and let Him be that. And when we have imitated David in his sin, let us imitate David in his repentance. Let us pray. God, we admit that all too often we put ourselves first, our desires first, our temptations first, and we make them more important than you. We find that we're all too easily able to imitate David's sin, but not his repentance. Would you help us to see our sin? Would you send Nathans into our lives to challenge us and to hold us accountable to your standards? And may we respond. May we stop our ways and turn once again to your grace, knowing that you're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to forgive if we just turn to you. For it's in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, we pray. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation whiter than snow wash me now and I will be whiter than snow a fitting response to the words of David asking to create in us a clean heart recognizing our own sin and turning towards God I believe we all have times in our lives moments in our lives every day where we need to turn from our own way and turn to God Maybe for the first time you would say, yeah, I need that forgiveness in my life. I'd love to talk with you about that. Or maybe you've been worshiping here for some time, and this is the place where you can grow in service and in love, and we would love to have you join with us. Whatever decision you have to make, make it now as we stand and sing together.
y'all please be seated and would, would you all stand for just a moment? Excited to introduce, well not introduce, you, you know them well. Um, these are the, the Fagans, Todd and Katie Fagans, um, who come uh, by transfer of letter from a sister church. Um, we've enjoyed just having them for, for some time now. I first met Todd when he was uh, coaching in upward basketball and, and just uh, doing a great job there, of course, in basketball, but he also had the heart for the ministry uh, in introducing Jesus to these kids, and I, I could see that all over everything he was doing, and I really appreciated that. And um, we just have loved getting to know them a little bit better, and their kids, Wilder, Betsy, PK, and Quinn. Whew, I had to remember that. Wilder, Betsy, PK, and Quinn, who are all somewhere, um, and they'll, you, you'll be getting to know them as well. Um, we're just excited to have this wonderful family. Is there a motion that we receive them as members uh, from Transfer of Letter? Is there a second? second. All in favor, please say amen. amen. And opposed, nay. And we're excited about this, guys. Um, Y'all just stay right here after we, we finish and say amen, and this congregation is going to come down and give you a handshake or a hug or, uh, and just welcome you into this fold of good people. Would you all please stand for a benediction? Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father, and as you go, remember that by the goodness of God you were born into this world, and by the grace of God you've been kept all the day long, even unto this hour. And by the love of God fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed.